two, three, four. Yes, I, I, okay, I tell you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, I tell you, I'm, I'm in a new position here, and, and that actually helps me appreciate how many times the microphone should be sticking in my nose, sticking in my face, who knows where. But I think you can hear me right now. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. This is Jewish Talk, coming to you live from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming live on the iHeart and iTunes app. We can also be seen... In the studios right now on my Facebook live page and on the Facebook WHBC on two Facebook pages. So that makes our program a double faced program. You get my humor? This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there. This is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. This all depends on when you're listening and when you're watching. And please, we encourage everyone to actually post their comments, um, say hello, let us know where you're uh, listening or watching, and it will be great, great to uh, interact with everybody. Today, I've chosen a, one of my pet peeves. Hey, what else is new with this rabbi? Today, of course, uh, have you ever, have a try, ever tried having a political discussion with friends Impossible, right? Passions run high. Invectives are hurled. Civility and logic I gewalt. They seem to have taken a, a leave. Why? What causes otherwise rational human beings to be, become so emotionally blinded when it comes to politics? Why can't both sides have strengths? Yeah, yes, believe it or not, everyone has some. And weaknesses. Yes, your candidate has some of those also. I've been puzzled over this question and we once again gear up to as we gear, gearing up now to endure another seemingly nasty presidential campaign yet this attitude is not limited to politics what about sports oh you should see what goes on in my shul how do you explain this amount of time yesterday on our at our kiddush on shabbos somebody gets up and he starts talking about the uh, the yankees and everybody knows exactly how many this and how many that and somebody else of course those who are, are mets fans they're looking down as if they were attending a funeral who knows what's going on here so how do you explain the amount of time the energy the emotion invested in a local team i come from england fans have been known to brutalize opposing fans after a soccer bra- uh, game People base their happiness on how their team fared over the weekend. I know a very bright businessman who goes to every every game, home and away. They are the, the, the repository of his deepest emotional investment. And if you went to the wrong school and are rooting for the wrong team, oi gewalt, oi gewalt, oi gewalt is a French word in case those you don't know. So how do you explain these reactions and attitudes? I recently came, uh, got some insight from a totally unrelated experience that I heard recently. But meanwhile, let me say hello to all those watching, to Gene Brandenstein and Harvey Kipnis. Oi, Gavald. Louis Pushkin is uh, joining us. To Karen Dumbeck. Thank you so much. Good morning. And uh, Doug Ugent has joined us. Dr. Kilshevsky is from Vermont today. Gavald, Vermont. Who goes to Vermont this time of the year? Sue Goldstein, Shalom Aleichem, Gus Stavis, and uh, who else do we have over here? We have so many people joining us, and if you have any comments, please feel free to, uh, to join us. And we're discussing why everybody can't have any conversations, civil conversations. So let me hear, tell you what happened recently. A family's daughter, somebody who lives in uh, the family, their daughter lives in Israel, and has a good friend who recently gave birth to a second child. Being a good friend herself, um, the daughter, the, the, her friend, tried to be helpful to her. She went to her friend, went to the hospital, she baked the food for the Friday night Shalom Zohar, she made the Sabbath meal for them when the, she would return home. So she, the, her friend was very grateful and said, you know, that her parents were coming to Israel from the United States and would be happy to bring her son anything she needed for her baby. Very nice. Being sensitive to people's packing needs, the, the, uh, this, the, this kind young lady's parents brought over, filled a large zip lock bag with a few items for their daughter. Two sweaters, a hat, and a jacket. 
Now, this may sound like a lot, but they, uh, they were for a, a five-month-old baby, so you can picture the size of the clothing. So uh, her friend's family, right, who were coming from America to Israel, were extremely gracious. They said, I'll take what I can, said the mother. My husband will bring the rest when he comes later. Great, thank you, right, the mother said. And she drove it over, she brought over this Ziploc bag of a few clothes. Now, being cramped for, for space, the mother, in the end, only had room for one sweater. <laughs> I tell you, my, one sweater. Picture, if you will, dear listeners, the size of that sweater for a five-month-old. It could fit in her pocket, but never mind. Okay. So, so the lady was a little surprised. But then, okay, the, the husband, the father was also coming, so maybe she'll get the stuff over to her daughter. The weather, it was starting to get chilly in Israel. So uh, the, the, uh, the daughter, right, the one who's expecting these uh, clothes, was awaiting these warmer clothes. Now the father calls. I'm terribly, terribly sorry. He says, quite sincerely, I just don't have any room. Right? May I remind you of the size of these items? Please come by and pick them up. Of course, the parents now who wanted to send their daughter a few clothes to Israel, she becomes outraged. They said their daughter went and helped their daughter in the hospital, bought, made food, etc., and, 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 and they did say they would be willing to bring over something. Now she had to go back and schlep to pick it up. She couldn't get over it. She was really annoyed and aggravated. Until her own husband pointed out that she seems to have invested this in this situation. It's a small incident. Invested seemingly a disproportionate amount of emotion into this. The minor nature of this frustration didn't seem to merit this emotional involvement it was it was a level of indignation indignation that should be reserved for crimes against humanity so really what what was going on and then i realized when i heard this story this wasn't about the particular details of the story this was the place where this person poured all of her anxieties and frustrations people tend to um have, you know, whether it's about this thing, about financial, people have frustrations. And sometimes it's very easy to just target something outside and throw all, instead of being, you know, frustrated or angry with a family and, and, and with herself, she used it against this other family who wouldn't take along uh, a couple of uh, sweaters. You see... In, instead of directing our frustrations inwardly, people find a safe external object to do this. I think this explains, you may not have to agree with me, but I think whether it's sports or politics, people are frustrated. Uh, their people have hopes, they have anxieties, and uh, instead of looking at it and, and becoming a little more internally thoughtful, let's uh, use our energy onto the team or the, the candidate. Instead of yelling at our boss or our employees, instead of losing it um, with our spouses or children, instead of directing our anger inwardly, we found some sort of a safe external object. If so, the emotion is disproportionate. The vehemence against those with which we disagree is a distortion. But it's better than the alternative. Rather, look at oneself. Hey, let's scream at someone else about this politician or about this team, etc. It's, it's not necessarily bad to take advantage of this opportunity for displacement, but perhaps with a little bit of perspective, a little understanding of its roots, we can learn some balance. We can root for our team without the need to disparage supporters of the opposing team. We can camp campaign for our candidate without spewing insults at the other side. Expressing aggression and other negative emotions through sports and politics may be healthy, but up to a point. When anyone who takes differing view becomes evil or unacceptable or unworthy, I think we've crossed the line. So I keep my mouth closed, especially in shul and other places. Don't, 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 say, don't get involved because there's so much emotion. And I tend to believe a lot of people's emotion is because they're rather than they have their own frustrations, so yeah, this is, or they use the kind of inner distortions of their own lives to shout at somebody else. 
See, friends and relatives should be able to engage in friendly, intelligent discourse about politics and about political candidates. After all, if we can't, who can? We should be able to have them about sports, whatever. If we can't, then we really lost perspective and have inappropriately displaced our emotions. We need a little, a kind of a reality check, a reminder that we were all created in the Almighty's image. And uh, I want to say hello now to Samantha Kennedy. Good morning to Sean Novat. Good morning, Sean. I can't believe it, Sean. Please. And Stephen Epstein. Stephen, you're the best. Letting everybody know in shul what's going on here. So uh, my question today is how to bring some civility and respect back to our conversations. Yeah, sorry. This is my pet peeve for the day. Where has civilized discourse gone? Television shouting matches, right? Rage-filled radio, except, of course, this program and all the wonderful programs here at WHBC. You have outlandish insults on social media. They're seeping into personal conversations. I actually read over Shabbos that people who swear a lot tend to be that kind of personality. If they're loose with themselves in their language... They become loose in attitudes about others. A recent poll found that three quarters of the Americans agree that good manners have dramatically declined in recent years. So, dear friends, here's some free information, free, uh, you know, uh, session on suggestions. Five common conversational openings that are particularly problematic and the alternatives that we can all choose to say instead. You don't have to agree with everything. In fact, let me know. Here goes. You know the expression, people like you. People like you. As soon as you hear that word, people like you, and it's happened to me, you shut down the conversation before it begins. It broadcasts that you have already decided all you know about them. People like you. I remember once meeting a woman who told me in a huff, I know what people like you must think of me. And she walked off. To this day, I have no idea what she meant, people like me. Because I'm Chabad. Because I'm observant. I've got brown eyes. What what do you mean, people like me? And the Jewish sage, Hillel, cautioned that we should never really know another person until we make an effort to learn about their life. Do not judge your fellow until you've reached his place. People are complex and worth getting to know. Next time you're tempted to sweepingly refer to people like you or people like them, stop and rephrase your statement as a question. That serious-looking person, you know, you're talking to might actually have a great sense of humor. Someone who seems completely different from you might share the same hobby or tastes. We all know appearances can be deceiving, and the beauty of conversation is in helping us to find the common ground that brings us together. Here's another one. This might be offensive, but... You know the expression? Yeah. This has lots of variations. I know... There's another one. I know this isn't PC. This might sound racist. You're not going to like what I'm about to say. Now, if you're starting a sentence with a warning of the offense of your comments... This is certainly going to cause someone to stop and ask are you, if you truly want to be saying this like at all. Is this the way you want to talk? Can you imagine what the other person thinks of you? This is the way you talk to them. There's another one. I know what you're going to say. Right? Someone said to me this on Shabbos. I know what you're going to say. Conversations can enable us to learn, to learn from and draw closer to others as we share experiences and thoughts. Or it can be a chance to talk past each other, never really listening to the other side. Being convinced that we already know the other person's opinions all but guarantees that we won't truly engage and hear what other people have to say. Let me quote from the American Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. He said, It is the province of knowledge to speak, and it is the privilege of wisdom to listen. A truly wise person doesn't assume they know everything about their interaction or the people they're talking to and makes an effort to truly listen. Without 
preconceived conceptions about what they might hear. But there's another one. There's another one. Did you hear that? Right? Did you hear that? Repeating gossip has far-reaching consequences. The Talmud tells us, metaphorically, tells us, warns us, that spreading gossip and slander kills three people. The person being gossiped at, the one speaking the slander, the slander and the innocent li- listener who becomes an unwittingly party to the denigration of others. Right? He becomes put down. Instead of introducing a juicy piece of gossip into conversation, try keeping it to yourself instead. You'll find yourself more respected as someone who can keep secrets and also avoid causing some of the damage that slander and gossip can cause. Again, I quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. She famously said, Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. And small minds discuss people. Another one. You're wrong. You're wrong. Can you imagine a conversation? You're wrong. An acquaintance of mine was mortified when someone told her, straight out in front of the crowd, what you're doing is totally wrong. In addition to being, I would say, untactful and rude, his comments directly violated an important Jewish principle. Criticisms or rebukes must be delivered privately and with sensitivity. Not only does this avoid embarrassing others, which the Torah teaches should be avoided at all costs, pointing out someone's error, or what you think is their error, privately and politely is much more effective. Finding a way to speak to people you disagree with in a calm, respectful, disarming manner can lead actually to a real conversation and change in a way that people, these public shouting matches with two egos on the line rarely do. Just go to the Sunday morning shows. It'll give you an idea what it talks about the egos. King Solomon said, The gentle words of the wise are heard above the shouts of a king over fools. That observation is particularly pertinent in today's outrageous filled discourse. Let's put some common sense and manners back into the way we speak to each other. Now, how do we maintain a civil discourse? Let me say hello to these wonderful people watching us here. Let's say hello to Ronald Reyes. Good evening from the Philippines. Oy, Caval, don't tell anybody. But we have someone listening from the Philippines. Don't tell the, uh, the county executive. They get nervous if this, you know, this is all about the county. Let me see who else is watching us here. Uh, Linda Mendenhall. Thank you so much. Zalman Stuart Wag. Thank you. Better to, to walk away. He suggests that uh, the best way to keep uh, conversations is to walk away from it. Okay. Fair enough. So let's get back to it now. How do we maintain a civil discourse? Well, you know, there's a book uh, le- uh, written by, uh, by, I believe it was George Washington, in his Rules of Civility and Decent Behavior in com- Company and Conversations. I think he was 16 when he wrote that book. And he says the following, Let your conversation be without malice or envy, for it is a sign of a tractable and commendable nature. And in all causes of passion, admit reason to govern. Ay, Gavalta. We often forget that our fellow citizens are more similar to each other than dissimilar. Our goals and ambitions are more analogous than antagonistic. As a consequence, our public and private discourse has become intensely personal, focusing on the differences rather than, you know, where the common common ground. So that friend, family, are and work relationships are frequently in peril. Civility to most people is simply being polite, reasonable, exhibiting respectful behavior. When people disagree, discussion becomes personal attacks. You can't talk about anything political today. Forget about it. Incidents of rudeness for other people are common, whether it's in the grocery stores, in the city streets, or even between neighbors. Most Americans believe that in this era of incivility is really harmful to our country's future. Surveys indicate that one of, th- one of three workers believe their workplace is uncivil, leading to job dissatisfaction, burnout, and stress. And um, so many people, uh, employees and ex-employees, 
who return to their jobs, they, they right, we heard stories of, they, they're so upset, they come back and they, they exact revenge. And what do we hear? Recently, even, God forbid, uh, mass murders. They're upset. So you're upset. You lost your job. Go, go, go over it. Go, go, go on. Well, they've got to come back and cause mayhem. There's a uh, Dr. Gary, a psychologist, he's a co-founder of the Workplace Bullying Institute. He notes that the lack of civility and bullying go hand in hand. And he says, how in the world can we stop bullying in schools, in the workplace, in politics, when it is so close to our national character right now? That's one of my thoughts. That what's, What goes on in Washington and anywhere around there actually has an effect right down to the local streets, local village. Civility means is claiming and caring for one's identity, needs, and belief without degrading someone else's in the process. It's about disagreeing without disrespect or being disagreeable, seeking common ground as a starting point for dialogue about differences and listening past one's own preconceptions, the stereotypes that we walk around with, and the prejudices that we sadly have. Good manners are the way we express our civility to others. Be a mensch! And it's very essential to managing good relationships. Humans are hyper-social creatures, and manners, conscious and unconscious acts that demonstrate our attitude to those around us really are crucial when establishing, maintaining, and enhancing connection and rapport. As I share this with you, my mind goes back to when I was a child, and we were in Hyde Park, right, in the center of London, Remember the Hyde Park corner? There's a place where everybody gets up on the soapbox and can say and sat like a mashugana. So I remember going with my mother. Uh, it was like a, a day a day outing, and we went from Stamford Hill to Hyde Park. Children, I'm telling you, we were about seven years old. It was great. Big park, beautiful, right? We all know in, in Mayfair, the center of London, near, near the, the palace, well, everything's kept beautifully. And as a child, I ran across the walkway, Right in the middle of the park. My mother said, don't do that. I said, what's wrong? I'm, I'm going to the other side. I actually walked in front of a woman. There was a woman walking. And I didn't wait for her to pass by before I ran to the other, to the other piece of grass. And my mother pointed out to me, you've got to be respectful. If a woman's going, you have to wait for her to go by. I, I've never forgotten that lesson. <laughs> you see that in New York? You see that anywhere in Long Island? Gavalt, yeah, forget about it, right? But those small little, just something in my mind, in my upbringing, just to being, having good manners. If you have good manners, you are good manners to others. Since personal happiness and unhappiness is a larger part, depends on the quality of relationship that we have with others, to build more harmonious relationship takes good manners, civility, and that leads us to leave, uh, leading a better quality of life. So here are several conditions which are likely to cause good manners to vanish. For example, exercise little personal restraint. See others as a means to an end rather than an end ends in themselves. Pursue p financial gain and personal achievement above everything else. Suffer continuous stress and fatigue and allow strangers to remain strangers. As a, uh, as a consequence of the overly heated rhetoric fueled by the partisan 24-7 news reports, the anonymity of the Internet, and the tendency of people to believe unsubstantiated rumors and, and fake news and fabrications, civility is difficult to achieve since we often mistake political adversaries for enemies. Yeah. So how do we improve our civility? Despite our differences in skin color, religious preference, age, occupation, truth is most of us seek harmony in our relation. We want to be uh, get on with everybody. The majority of us seek an environment where bullying is rare, if not eliminated. We mutually desire safe workplaces and schools where each person is respected and considered valuable. Almost everyone agrees that the level of incivility in our communities leads to stress, unhappiness, violence, loss of hope. It is the responsibility of every one of us, every person to pursue and, pr and practice civility. Practicing, you know, 
Find some techniques that can lower that emotional heat that we have, even when we're unable to find common grounds for, for perspective. You know, uh, there's a, they try to understand someone else's perspective. And I, I, I meet people, of course, of different persuasions, different religions, different political you know, perspectives. You know, the adage is, you can't understand another person's experience until you walk a mile in their shoes. It's p- particularly true when it comes to perspective. While it can be difficult to look at issues from the po- viewpoint of those who disagree with you, logic and humility requires us to recognize that other people's desire for comfort and happiness is as valued as your own. Yeah, I, sorry. Sorry to, to, to bring that to your attention. Another thing that I think is important, demonstrate empathy. The root of many contentious relationships is this presupposition that the other side neither understands nor cares about the feelings or uh, opinions of other parties, probably due to previous experience. So as a consequence, they are belligerent, determined to strike first, you know, to anticipate some emotional power that they may have. So the best strategy is to ignore their aggression and express empathy for position. If you show understanding, you know, showing understanding is not the same as, a, as agreement. Demonstrate that you understand their position, as well as the reasons they have come to their conclusions. Guess what? Allows you to proceed without the emotional baggage that complicates reaching any agreement. It also places the focus on the issue rather than the two parties. So you can work together to arrive at some mutually satisfactory conclusion. Dear friends, I'm not on the uh, peace team trying to make peace in the Middle East, but I tell you some of these ideas maybe should be incorporated, at least something. And I would say, you know, something that I try very much is to show respect to everybody. Respect for yourself and to those who might disagree with you is really critical to civility. In practice, this means giving other people the opportunity to state their opinions and recognizing there may be points in which you can agree. Do not presume that they know their positions, as you may be incorrect, based upon your own prejudices and stereotypes. Listen to what they have to say, recognizing that you do not have to agree to be courteous and to be nice and to be respectful. My friends, this is really a tip. No, final word, final word, my friends. Civility is essential in our lives, if we are to build strong, lasting relationships. At the same time, reducing the level of incivility present in our communities and political system seems almost impossible. Rather than setting unrealistic goals which may be impractical to achieve, the better approach is to start on a personal level. Ourselves, look in the mirror. Doing what you do to be more civil and serving as a model to those who we interact with is a good beginning. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl. Thanking you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful, good week. All the best. Thank you again.